Lord, we just thank you for the love that you have for us. The love that is, has been proven so perfectly. For you loved us so much that you gave everything. So that we could know you. And be known by you. As sons and daughters of God. Redeemed. Redeemed. And placed back in, in the right, right position. As a son and daughter of God. And for that we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Well, you can be seated. Uh, for those of you who can be seated. And, uh. So praise the Lord, that's good. That is good. Oh, man. I'm just telling you what, this is pretty awesome, isn't it? I mean, this is all right. This is all right. I love it, man. I love it. So you're going to, uh, you all are very blessed today. I just thought I'd just let you know that because you are going to get to hear probably the fastest message that you've ever heard me preach. So, uh, or shortest anyway. That'd be great. So, uh, so somebody else said, well, I'll believe it when I see it. So, uh, we're, we're going to get after it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, it's really neat to be able to, to gather as families. We have kids here, and uh, and it's so good. So kids, we're glad that you get to hang out with us. Uh, man, parents, don't worry about your kids. It's all right. I, I know what it is sometimes to be stressed out because maybe your kids not doing exactly what you want. This is a family service. That's just how it's going to be. So that's okay. So let the kids be kids, and we're, we're going to hear about Jesus. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Hey, before I get going, um, Keith Roberts, can you hear me back there? Praise the Lord, buddy. Hey, I, I feel like the Lord just gave me a simple word for you, and I can't see you that good, but I'm just going to say it. Is that okay? Thumbs up if it's okay. Praise the Lord. I heard in my spirit, dormant is not dead. Dormant is not dead. And I saw a, a sheet, uh, like, a, like a big, like a heavy blanket. It was kind of laid on the ground. And, uh, and, what, and I saw I, I saw the picture of the hand of the Lord coming down and picking up a corner that was under that heavy blanket. And whenever he, he just loosed it back like that, and out from under there sprung creative life. And so, like, and here's what I think. And I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know very much about like your. I mean, I know you're a talented guy. You build things and everything. But I feel like the, the word of the Lord, dormant is not dead, is speaking towards creative talents in worshiping abilities, writing abilities, and things like that that have been in your life, that have been a part of your life, and I feel like the Lord says that He's breathing new life on it. Maybe a season that you thought, well, that's past. It's not past. It's been dormant. It's not dead. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name that you would release life over these gifts again. There will be a fresh fire blown, and that these these, these will be revealed to the to the world. I mean, I actually even say that in Jesus' name. That dormant is not dead. And he's calling things absolutely back to a thriving place of life in Jesus' name. So stir it up, Holy Spirit. Release and go and grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, buddy. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. Judges chapter six. 11 through 14. We're going to read it. So this sermon has now officially turned into a two-parter. Say two-parter. We're going to do, a, we're gonna, I think there's, a, I think I have a six or seven points, uh, six points, but today you're going to get one of them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. So uh, this is a two-part message, and, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and read the scripture to you. This was a message I was actually fortunate enough to, to speak at a, uh, a, a pastor's conference that I was a part of. And, uh, and then I came back and I just kind of have revamped and reworked it this week to speak to us and to where we are as individuals even right now. And, uh, and I feel like the Lord just really is going to develop some things in us through this word. So uh, let's go ahead and read it. Judges chapter 6, 11 through 14. You can read it with me on the screens above. I know they're not here, but I'm just used to saying it. So... The angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree, uh, under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abarazite, and his son Gideon. He was beating the wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. In verse 13, Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midian. 
The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Pray with me over this word. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is able to fully accomplish everything that it is set forth to do. Lord, your word goes forth as good seed. And your people are good soil. And your promise... Your promise is that when good seed falls on good soil, good fruit is produced. And I thank you in Jesus' name for the fruit that will be produced in the lives of your people from your word. Father, may it be 30, 60, and 100 fold. If you're ready for the word, say yes. Come yes. on. Oh, all right. Okay, so I feel like the Lord is inviting us into a spirit-full life. It's one thing to be spirit-filled. How many of you guys know that when you said yes to Jesus, the Spirit of God was given to you as a deposit, confirming and guaranteeing those things which are to come? That's a promise of the Word. So if you have surrendered your life to Jesus and you are a walking, talking, Jesus-believing, following, redeemed Son and Daughter of God, then you have been given this deposit, the Holy Spirit, to infill, to fill you, confirming you to be a son and daughter of God, confirming the relationship that you were destined to have, that Jesus paid for you to walk in. So it is one thing to be spirit-filled, but I believe that God wants us to live from being spirit full. And, there's, and here, here's, here's the difference that I want to talk about. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8, Jesus is giving a command to his disciples. And he tells them, as you go, he's saying you have an assignment. Every single one of us have an assignment. Do you know that? And our assignment is not merely to come together together for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning and go off and do our own thing and have, and, and have a little thing called blessed assurance and come back from week to week. We have an assignment, we have a purpose, we have a calling, and that is to walk full of the Spirit of God into what God has called us to do every single day that we live. In Jesus' name. I'm preaching to the first three rows so far. Okay. So as you go, Jesus is saying, as you go, you have an assignment. This assignment is to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And with that proclamation, or with that declaration, there will be a demonstration that accompanies it. He said, as you proclaim, demonstrate this reality. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you've received, now freely give. Notice again, I said that it started with the proclamation and it was confirmed by the demonstration. Every single one of us are, are given the message, are given the Spirit of God, have been confirmed as sons and daughters of God. And if you have a, a uh, if you have experienced the saving grace of Jesus, you have a testimony. Amen? That testimony is a message. So carry a message. And then it's not enough just to carry the message, but how many of you know that we're called to walk the message out? We're called to walk it out so people should be able to see the way that we live and tell who has taken residence inside of us. They see the way we live and they know whose we are. Come on, somebody. So Jesus, he makes the proclamation. This is what you are to do. Freely you've received, now freely give. Now, I think that sometimes the focus can also be be like in an unhealthy way that's pushed to, uh, to, to always give away, to give, 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 to do, 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 all of the time. But how many of you know you can, the reality is you can only give from that which you have received. You can't give out of what you don't have. Whenever, whenever that happens, that, that, that's called being in the red. You know, I mean, you, has anybody ever ran out of money before you ran out of month? Has that ever happened to anybody else? All right. I mean, that, that, that's that, that's being in the red. You're, you're giving. You're, you're giving more. You have to give. You have to give away more than you have. And I think that sometimes that can happen spiritually. And here's the reality, guys. So how do we avoid that from happening in our lives? Knowing that every single one of us, every single one of you, have been called have been saved, have been redeemed if you've given your life to Jesus. And because you've been called, because you've been saved, because you've been redeemed, you have a purpose. Do you, do you believe this? Do you believe this? All the way in the back. Do you believe this? And with that purpose comes a work that you were created to walk in. The Word of God tells us, it, it, it sets this up and says, that they would see your good works and glorify your Father in Heaven. I'm called to live in such a way that people would see the fruit of my life, and not only by what I say, but the way that I live, the things that I do, man, that my actions in my life, that the work of my life would bring 
but would bring the revelation and glory to my Father in heaven. Every single one of us, friends. That's all of our, that's our, that's our calling. We have a shared calling in this. But here's the thing. We can only give, as I said, from what we've received. We are not called to be empty vessels. Every single one of us. We are a vessel. We are a vessel. Our bodies are a vessel to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But we're not called to be an empty vessel. Do you know what we're called to be? A broken vessel. We're called to be a broken vessel. That's what the Word says. Why? Because empty vessels cannot hold anything. They're not holding anything. But broken vessels, broken vessels can't help but leak the reality of what fills them. You see, I'm broken. There's a song that's, that's, that's titled Beautifully Broken. Man, this is like, I'm broken, I'm broken in order to leak the reality of what's inside of me. It's not, God hasn't filled me in order to put a cap on it so that I'm the only one that ever gets to experience what he's done in my life. He's filled me, broken as I am, so that I would pour out the reality of what he's poured into me. And it's a continual flow. And if I don't come back to the place to get filled again, all of a sudden, I'm going to run dry. And if I'm not continually positioning myself in a place where his presence fills me, yet again, I'm going to eventually get to the point to where I'm trying to pour from an empty vessel. And the only thing that happens whenever you're trying to pour from an empty vessel is you get burned out, you get jaded, you get... Oh, man, all this other stuff starts to fill up, guys. We have to stay connected to the presence of God where he can fill us up again so that we can freely give what we've freely been given. Amen? So I want to simply talk to you guys about one point today in this six-point message entitled, It's in the Press, is this. We're going to talk about what, we're, what we have to press into. Number one, this is it, easy, easy for you note-takers, is that we're pressing into faithfulness. Press into faithfulness. In, Josh, in Judges 6, verse 11 uh, 12, it says that the angel of the Lord sat under the tree that was an oak which belonged to Joash the Abrazite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to save it from the Midianites. Okay, so get this picture. Gideon. We, we read in scripture later that Gideon is the youngest, the youngest one in his family. He's the youngest sibling in the family. And he's doing a job that no one wanted to do. This was the like the like the, the job that nobody looked forward to. So picture that job that you that you've had in your life that nobody wanted to do, but you got stuck doing it. That's Gideon right now. So Gideon is in a wine press. He's threshing the wheat. So we, we see the, the the wheat that's growing up all around us. It won't be long till it's being harvested. And then the wheat that the heads of the wheat they kernel out. And what they do is that they would take those that kernel wheat that's on the heads and they would beat that wheat against the, the sides of the wine press. They would beat it until the kernels of the, that were in the heads of the wheat would fall out. And so that's how they would thresh and they would separate the wheat that was on the stalk from everything else. And then, so that's what Gideon was doing. It's not a job that he enjoyed doing. In fact, there was a little bit of shame involved in Gideon doing this job. Because traditionally, this job was reserved at that time for the women and the girls in the family. So this was a job that usually, while, while the men were out working and gathering and planting and everything else that the men were supposed to do, they would bring the harvest back to the girls and the women, and they would be the ones that would thresh out the wheat. So now Gideon, in Jewish culture, this was actually a, a covering of shame that Gideon was involved in. He's doing a job that A, he didn't want to do, B, was a job that he didn't think was, he was even supposed to do, but this is what he was doing. So we're talking about how do we step into and live a spirit-full life. Guys, remember, the only point we're talking about today is pressing into faithfulness. It's in the press. Tell somebody it's in the press. Gideon was in the press, and in the press, what happened? Well, Gideon, as I said, is doing a job he didn't want to do, and this, guys, can be a dangerous place. Because what can happen... What has the potential to happen is that it's oftentimes when we find ourselves in a place that we didn't want to be, doing maybe what we didn't want to do, that there can be a danger of comparison. We can begin to look at what other people are doing and we compare it to what we find ourselves doing. Social media is a great platform for this. That we get to look at everyone else's highlights. 
Everyone else's smiles, everyone else's vacations, everyone else's perfect kids. I don't know how you all have perfect kids. My kids are not perfect. They're close. They're close. I love them with all my heart, but they are far from perfect. And all I see on Instagram is your perfect kids, and it makes me sick. No, I'm just joking. I love your kids, I promise. But I'm saying, like, guys, it's, it's crazy, man. Like, all we see are the highlights, the good things. And we, and we fall into this trap of comparing what we know about ourselves and our current situation to what we see everyone else walking in. Because the reality is, we, we, don't, we don't put our stuff out there. And so we, we, we insulate and we find ourselves insulated doing what we don't necessarily want to do, but we know maybe we're called to do it. And it's not as fun. It's not as, it doesn't seem like it can be as fulfilling. And so we fall into this trap that can be this comparison trap. And I, I have to think that at some point, Gideon probably fell into this place. But I will tell you that even though Gideon might have fallen into this, guys, he didn't, he didn't allow where he was to remove him from where he was supposed to be. He didn't allow the comparison. He didn't allow even the disdain he might have had for what he was doing to remove him from where he was assigned to be. And I think that's a lesson that we can learn from Gideon. But listen, it was while Gideon, now this is so important, it was while Gideon was doing the job that no one wanted to do, that's when God showed up. I want to say that again because someone needs to catch the correlation for maybe what you're walking through in life right now, but you're doing it faithfully. Maybe you're doing something or, or you're walking through something physically, spiritually. No one would want to trade places with you. In fact, if you could, you would bail shit on that situation real quick because it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. Everything else looks better everywhere that you go. But it was right in the middle of what Gideon didn't want to be doing that God showed up and met him. Why, guys? God knew where to find Gideon. Why? Because Gideon was there the day before. Gideon was faithful even in what he didn't want to do. The Lord came. The word says that the Lord came to sit. That word sit means abide and dwell under the tree while he threshed the wheat. God knew Gideon would be there because Gideon was there the day before. He was in the press, faithful to his assignment. He was faithful to what he had been assigned to do. So we're talking about living from the overflow, being spiritual. But oftentimes, we reduce being spiritual to a feeling or an experience. Anybody else? We try to reduce being spiritful or filled with the spirit to an excitement or a feeling that we get whenever we get the goosebumps, whenever everything just kind of changes, we're like, ooh, that feels good. And now oh, I felt the spirit on that one. I mean, that's what we do a lot of times. We make, we make this mistake that it's all about a feeling or an experience. There's a problem with this. Because if we are reducing being spiritful or living full of the spirit to a feeling, the problem is that feeling becomes the determining factor on what we do. If we're always chasing a feeling, sometimes we will forsake faithfulness for a feeling. Sometimes we will make the mistake of forsaking a call to faithfulness in pursuit of another feeling. That's dangerous, friends. Because it's when we are pursuing things that gratify the feelings that we enjoy, we can often get out of the assignment and the purpose that God has called us to. So here we are. And we feel, we see this everywhere, guys. It happens. And, you know, and it, it happens here. It happens. It, it's everywhere in life. It's like we, we say, well, I don't do blank. You, you fill it in because I don't feel it. I, I don't do this because I don't feel led to. Well, I don't do even the things that I'm supposed to because I don't feel like it in the moment. I don't, I, I don't, man, I, I don't take the time to seek the Lord and read my Bible and do the things that I know that I'm called to do because honestly, man, I'm just tired. I'm just tired today. I don't feel like it. I mean, can, can I just get really practical in a family service when all the kids are here with us? I don't do what I know that God has called me to do because the reality is, man, I, I don't feel like I get anything from it. You know how many times I've heard that? Well, I love Jesus, but I don't read the Bible because I don't feel like I, I really get anything from it. 
So getting the word of God has been re- getting the word of God in your spirit has been reduced to what feels good to you. I'm not talking to anybody. I know this. This is going live somewhere. But we do that, don't we, friends? It's about what I feel. It's about what I like. I don't spend time in worship because I don't. Man, I, I don't have the time. I don't feel like I have the time. And, and it's inconvenient. I, I, I don't serve because, well, I haven't found the place that I really like. I, I, I don't meet the needs that I can see right in front of me because I'm just not feeling led, brother. I don't go pray for people because, again, well, I'm, I'm just waiting to feel led to do it. Man, it's, it's, I, I told our elders one time in a meeting, I said, guys, here's what we need to do. Every single one of us need to put a put a fishing weight in our pocket. And then, you know, a lead fishing weight. And every time we see somebody that needs to get prayed for and you don't feel like it, just reach down in your pocket and feel that lead so you can say, okay, I feel lead now. Now I'm going to go. If we're waiting to feel lead, come on. And this is for every single one of us. It's for every single one of us. When you see something that you can do, don't wait until you feel that lead in your pocket. Say, hey, there's an opportunity for me to step into in this moment, maybe for what God has placed me in, in this moment, to step into something that God has reserved in this moment for me to do. I don't have to feel like it. I just have to do it. Come on, somebody. Oh, man. So now I'm going to get really honest with you, okay? I'm almost done with point one, so we're about done. Praise the Lord. I'm going to get really honest with you, all right? We're really vulnerable in an outside setting. Sometimes, I don't know, maybe more than 50%, maybe. I don't know. Sometimes, I don't feel like it. Sometimes, I don't feel like it. Pastor doesn't feel like it sometimes. Just being honest. But you know what? Do you know what I do when I don't feel like it? I do it anyway. I do it anyway. I worship even when I don't feel like it. I pray even when I don't feel like it. I read my Bible even when I don't feel like it. I pray for the sick when I don't feel like it. I prophesy when I don't feel like it. Because what I do for Jesus is not determined by my feelings. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about what he's done for me. It's about me recognizing the worth of my king and saying how shameful it is for me to reduce what I would return to you based on how I feel in this moment. This is not about me. He gave everything for me. And he is worthy of all of me. Come on, somebody. It's not about how I feel. It's about his worth. He's worth the return that he invested in me. Come on. I love you, but I don't care if you feel like it or not. Listen, my obedience cannot be based on my feelings. It's about the res- my response to the one who is worthy of my whole life. The worship team is going to come back now. I told you this is going to be short and easy. But here's the thing, guys. Sometimes what you don't need, a lot of times, what you don't need is a feeling. What you need is discipline. You need discipline in your life. And this is just me being really pastoral in this moment. You need discipline in your life. You need to be disciplined to do the things that 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 you know God has called us to do. You need to develop the discipline to do what God has called us to do the things that are going to produce life in you. The word of God in you will not return void. It will accomplish what it's sent forth to do. So get in the word. Allow the God to allow the word of God to plant seeds in your heart and your spirit so it will mature and produce good fruit. It's not about what you feel, it's about developing the spiritual disciplines necessary to live a life called unto God. It's just fun and it's practical, amen. It's in the press. So friends, family, we have to press in to faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet with us this morning? We're going to come back into a just a a quick time of worship. And then we're going to be blessed. God is so good. He is so good. So let's, let's worship the Lord one more time together.